says about dinosaurs. So again, we already saw that they, don't, they did not live millions of years ago. And they did not evolve into birds. Alright, so where did the dinosaurs come from? Where did the dinosaurs come from? Well, the simple answer is pretty obvious. Anybody raise their hand and tell me where did the dinosaurs come from? No. <laughs> Alright, where? Good job. Come get another prize. I, I think the preacher's kid answering all the questions is kind of stacked. Over there. Pick, pick a prize over there. So I think, I think there's a little nepotism going on here. <laughs> so, yeah. So, again, the simple answer, where, where did dinosaurs come from, how they get here, the simple answer is God made them. So does the Bible actually say when the dinosaurs were created? Well, yes, yes it does. So, if we take our pterosaur friend up here who likes to fly around in the sky, what day of creation do you think they were made? Anybody? What day did God make the flying animals that we call birds? Yeah, all flying animals were made on the same day. So it'd actually be on day five. And also your marine reptiles were made on day five as well. Let's look at Genesis chapter one, verses twenty through twenty-three. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the fowl multiply on the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So on day five, God made all the water creatures. Not just fish, but the jellyfish, the octopus, the clams, the oysters and stuff, but also whales dolphins, and even marine reptiles. The ones that stay in the water and swim around the entire time. All those would have been created on day five. But he not only made all the animals in the water, he also made all the animals that are flying in the air, which includes mostly birds, right? Birds are the main things that fly around in the air. But that would also include the pterosaurs, the flying reptiles as well. They would fly around also. So he ended up making these creatures on day five. But these creatures are not technically dinosaurs, right, by our definition from yesterday. Whereas dinosaurs all walk on the ground, right, walk on dry land. They have their legs underneath them and raise their body up off the ground, right, just like this right here, right, so, and that's right there. So those are technically dinosaurs, so anybody tell me, when, would di when God made all the land-walking animals? What day is creation? Uh, day six. Good job. And that's when God ends up making, you want a prize? Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, tur I'm turning that into a meme. All right. <laughs> so, let's, so day six of creation. So again, Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 and 25 and God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and the beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and, every, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So God made dinosaurs on day six. That is when he ends up again making the dinosaurs. Well, if God created dinosaurs, did, what did the dinosaurs originally eat? <clears throat> well, most people argue that good old T-Rex right here, let's look at him for a little bit. So the T-Rex had very sharp teeth up to six inches long. They are very big teeth, 
Very sharp teeth. So how would you describe this animal that has very big, sharp teeth as a plant eater, a meat eater, a scavenger, or a plant and meat eater? Lamar, what would you think this would be? Yeah, most people would say meat eater. You won't get a prize. You pick the one thing that everybody picks. All right. So, yeah, so a lot of people would argue that because this animal has these big, huge, sharp teeth that it eats meat. Why do we think that? Because we're told that our entire life in science class and in biology, looking at zoology and animals and stuff, we're taught that sharp teeth equals meat eater. Dull teeth equals plant eater, right? That's what we're taught. But what does the Bible say about what animals ate when God created them? The Genesis chapter 1, verses 29 and 30. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. Guess what? This giant lizard that had these big, huge, sharp teeth and everything, it originally ate plants. Well, why would they need sharp teeth to eat plants and stuff? Have you ever seen a coconut and try to bite into a coconut? T-Rex could sit there and just chomp that into two pretty easily. Or a giant watermelon. He, he'd have a good feast on some of these bigger things that are really hard, right? We'd have a hard time biting into it, but he could just sit there and chomp it pretty easily. See, the crazy thing is we're taught that sharp teeth ends up meaning meat eater, but it does not actually mean that. Just because an animal has sharp teeth does not mean that it eats meat. So let's look at a few things here. So here's a skull of an animal with some big sharp teeth right here and everything. Vicious looking thing, right? Looks like it'd be look like it'd rip into somebody really easily. And everything. Well, this skull belongs to a deadly bamboo eater of a panda. That was a panda skull. So pandas, they have sharp teeth, but what? They eat bamboo. Why do you think they need sharp teeth? Bamboo's very, very strong. In fact, J uh, Chinese still use it today to build a whole lot of things. And when, uh, so again, they need the sharp teeth to bite into that. In fact, most bears in general are herbivores. They tend to eat plants. They'll eat meat when they have to, but they do eat a lot of plant life. A lot of bears do that. Here's another one. Look at those fangs on that thing. Surely that must be a meat eater. No. So that actually belongs to the black uacari in South, or South America. And they primarily eat nuts and fruit and vegetation. Even though they have these big sharp teeth, they primarily eat nuts, fruit, and vegetation. Here's another skull of another animal. Again, look at those fangs on that thing, right? So surely that has to eat meat and everything. Well, actually, this skull belongs to a fruit bat, and you have only one guess as to what a fruit bat eats. Yeah. Yeah, if you get this one wrong, then, you know, uh, I, there's no hope for you, all right? So, yeah, so fruit bats have these sharp teeth and everything as well. And, of course, they eat fruit. What about this thing right here? Man, look at the fangs on that. And that is actually a live animal today. This is actually the Chinese water deer. And it's actually called, nicknamed the vampire deer. Any guess as to why they nicknamed it the vampire deer? Yeah, because of the fangs and such. But guess what? It primarily eats grass. So... Sharp teeth does not always mean meat eater. Just because they have sharp teeth doesn't mean they eat meat. They can surely eat plants as well. And most of these, anim all these animals we just looked at do. 
So just because we see a fossil of, a, of an animal that has sharp teeth does not automatically mean that it was a carnivore, that it ate meat. So the question is, so if God made the dinosaurs on day five, or sorry, on day six and made the marine reptiles and pterosaurs on day five, why is the word dinosaur not in the Bible? I challenge anybody to look in your Bible and try to find the word dinosaur. You, unless you find a very, very, very new modern translation, you probably ain't going to find one. And I'm talking about a translation within the last year or two. But dinosaur is not found in the Bible. Well, the word Bible is not found in the Bible. Neither is the word trinity. And stuff like that. Things that we know are true. Rapture is not in the Bible. All these things we know that are true are there, but they're just not named what we call them. See, the word dinosaur is actually a fairly new word. It was not invented until 1841. The word dinosaur was not invented until the year 1841. It was invented by Sir Richard Owen. I mentioned him last night. He is the first person to actually see, look at dinosaur fossils and categorize them as a different type of animal. And he ends up calling them dinosaurs, which ends up translating to terrible lizard. Bad lizard. You're a terrible excuse for a lizard. No, so terrible in this sense it usually means amazing or awe-inspiring. So Ivan the Terrible is actually Ivan the Awesome, as he said in Night of the Museum 2, Battle of Smithsonian. But it just doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? But he was actually pretty terrible. <laughs> yeah, the Bible even uses terrible to define God also. So, the King James Bible, does anybody know what year it first came out? So, pastor? Yeah. So, the King James Bible is written in 1611. Is that a little bit earlier than 1841? There's actually many words that are even older than dinosaur that we would think are pretty modern. Locomotive, computer, all those are actually older than the word dinosaur. And we think that they're actually, it would probably be more modern. But again, the King James Bible was written in 1611. The word dinosaur was not invented for another 230 years. It's kind of hard to put a word in a book if it's not invented yet. Right? So the question is, all right, so is there another big reptile creature that everybody talks about that sounds like a dinosaur but has a mythological name to it? Anybody? A big giant reptile? That has a mythological name to it. Give you a hint. Huh? Can't hear you in the back. Dragons, right? I wish I had more dragons, but this is my favorite thing I've got at an auction. It, and everything it sits on top of my computer desk at my house. Everything, but it is a Chinese dragon. But I'm trying to hopefully find some more dragons like this so I can have both dragons and dinosaurs up here. It'd be pretty interesting. But again, yeah, dragons are dinosaurs. The word dragon is actually the old word for dinosaur. You mean dragons were real? Oh, yes. Yes, they are. So let's look at the word dragons. So again, with the dragons, you never believe it, but there are dragon legends from all over the planet. Every culture on the earth has some type of dragon legend. Just like every culture on the earth has some type of flood legend. Imagine that. So, if every culture on the planet has some type of legend of these big, huge reptile creatures that they call dragons, how are they mythological? If everybody claims to have seen them and have them around. So we'll talk more about the dragon legends and stuff tomorrow. So come back tomorrow. 
So the word dragon is actually found in the dictionary. and You can even find it in a dictionary in the 1600s. In the 1600s, it says that they are actually very rare. The dragons were very rare by 1600. Even as modern as like the 1940s, you still have the word dragon also, and they still also say that they're very rare even at that point. So we do have the word dragon being there. Now, dragon is actually more inclusive than dinosaur. Remember, dinosaur is a land dwelling reptile with the legs underneath that raises the body up off the ground, right? Dragon not only just, uh, talks about dinosaurs, but it also covers your pterosaurs as well as your marine reptiles. So it actually is more inclusive. It includes everything. And I think that's why we tend to put them all together and lump them as dinosaurs and everything because we all lumped them together as dragons way back in the day as well. So again, so dragons, like I said, include the marine reptiles and the pterosaurs. So the word dragon. The word dragon is actually found 35 times in the Bible. If you do a word search, you can find the word dragon 35 times in God's word. However, when you're not talking about the devil, there are 22 references to the word dragon that do not actually refer to devil. Many of those references actually come out of the book of Revelation that talks about the devil being a dragon, the great red dragon, etc., etc. So if we nix all those, because we know who that's talking about, we have 22 references of the Bible talking about real breathing dragons. So let's look at a few scripture references of this and see what it's talking about here. So we got Job chapter 30, verse 29, where it says, I am a brother to dragons and a companion to owls. He's mentioning dragons and owls in the same breath. Why would he talk about a mythological animal and a real animal together? That would not make any sense, right? How can you be a brother to a dragon if the dragon's not real? Psalm 74, 13. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. I'm talking about your pleosaurs, again, your marine reptiles, all of them. So again, you have the dragons in the waters mentioned here. Isaiah 34, 13. The thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof, and it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. It's amazing how owls and dragons keep being mentioned together in God's word. Owls are scavengers. Guess what? A lot of the dragons or dinosaurs have been scavengers too. In a lot of ways, they just go through and just get whatever they can. In fact, anybody know what the average size of a dinosaur was? We tend to think they're these big, huge, tall things right here. The average size of almost all dinosaurs is actually about the size of a sheep. They're actually very small. You do have the really big ones, but almost, but if you take all of them together, they're mostly about, you know, yay tall. The Velociraptor that stands up six tall in Jurassic Park is about the size of a turkey, by the way, in real life. <laughs> Amazing how they change things for movies, right? So Isaiah 30, or 43, 20. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. So here God is saying that the beasts, the dragons and the owls will actually, what, honor him, worship him. Why? So how could a mythological creature honor God? If it's not real, how could it honor God? Jeremiah 9.11 I will make Jerusalem heaps and a den of dragons. And I will make the cities of Judah desolate without inhabitation. Bringing in the condemnation on Jerusalem before Nebuchadnezzar comes in and wipes it out and levels it pretty much. 
was to make it a den of dragons. People aren't going to live there, but dragons, these large reptiles, are actually going to make it their home. Jeremiah 14, 6. And the wild asses did stand in the high places. They snuffed up the wind like dragons. Their eyes did fail because there was no grass. So we're talking about wild donkeys here. And they're going to act like dragons because they can't find any food. So they're going to be very angry and upset because they can't find any grass. So here we see many references to dragons in God's word. But guess what? God also describes some animals that sound oddly like dinosaurs in the book of Job. I always love Job. The, the last few chapters are my favorite. Trying to get up to that point is kind of a burden sometimes. If you ever read Job, it ends up, better have some time because it's confusing. But if we can get through it, then there's a lot of good stuff there. So let's look at Job chapter 40. And we're going to look through verses 15 through 24. It says, Behold now Behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass, his bones are like bars of iron. So notice his tail like a cedar tree, right? That's a big tree. That's a big tail. Mm -hmm. So he is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring, forth, bring him forth food where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and ferns, or fins. So the shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river, and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up the Jordan in his mouth. He taketh it with his eyes, and his nose pierceth through snares. So he had this creature that has a giant huge tail like a cedar tree who could, when he drinks, he could probably drink up the entire river. He's a chief of the ways of God. His bones are like the bars of iron and brass. Again, this is a seropod dinosaur. Behemoth what we end up viewing that as probably a seropod dinosaur. These are the biggest dinosaurs that we have. The largest one is called Seismosaurus. Why well, then they called it Seismosaurus? Be no, because every time it stepped on the ground, the earth quaked. <laughs> Seismograph, right? So, again, so Seismosaurus is the biggest one because, again, it would have shaken the ground as it walked. Well, no, Nessie is a plesiosaur. Loch Ness Monster would be a plesiosaur. It looks like this, but instead of legs, it has fins. So we'll talk about that tomorrow, though. It's all right. Now, the crazy thing is, is that many Bible commentators try to state that this is an elephant or a hippo. And if you look at any footnote of a lot of Bibles or any Bible commentaries and you look in Job 40 where Behemoth is and go down and they'll say, well, this is an elephant or a hippo. Okay. Has anybody ever seen the tail of an elephant? Does that look like a cedar tree? <laughs> what about the tail of a hippo? Doesn't really look like a cedar tree either, right? That, that, those, the, the hippo didn't even have what you would even probably be able to call a tail. It has a, it has a stub. <laughs> well, what would have a tail like a cedar tree? What about that? Wouldn't you say that actually has more of a tail like a cedar? And everything, again, this would be more of what God was describing Again, if this is going to be chief of the ways of God, if you looked up to that, I mean, you see the size compared to a man and car and everything. You looked and saw that, I think you would be wanting to go the other way unless you had friends <laughs> to help you. 
I would it'd be awe striking that you see God making such a creature, right? That would actually help out. But there's another dinosaur. Well, we say dinosaur it would be a marine reptile, but it'd be falling to the line of dragon. And Joe and God continues his rebuttal against Job in chapter 41. So we're gonna look at the entire chapter. So bear with us here. So canst thou draw out Leviathan? With a hook, or his tongue with a cord, which thou lettest down. Canst thou put a hook into his nose, or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Wilt thou take him for a servant forever? Wilt thou play with him as with a bird? Ah, there you go, they're not birds. (laughs) Or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet for him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons, or his head with fish spears? Lay thine hand upon him, remember the battle, do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Who hath prevented me, that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. Again, God talking about himself there. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. Who can discover the face of his garment? Or who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride. Shut up together as with a close seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. So the scales are super tight and affixed. They are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be sundered. By his nestings a light does shine and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. So he's not only a marine reptile, but he's also a fire-breathing marine reptile. In his neck remaineth strength, and sorrow is turned into joy before him. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone, yea, as hard as a piece of the nether millstone. When he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breakings, they purify themselves. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold the spear, the dart, nor the habergon. He esteemeth iron as straw and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp pointed things upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh the path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Upon earth there is not his like. Who is made without fear? He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. So again, you have Leviathan here. Sounds like something you don't want to mess with, right? So again, Leviathan was some type of sea reptile. We don't know exactly what kind. There's a lot of different ideas, but he's some type of marine reptile. And if you actually read it in the Bible, do a word search on Leviathan, he's actually equated with Satan quite a bit in Isaiah, where Satan is basically called Leviathan. And there's a reason for this comparison. Leviathan is somebody you don't want to mess with. It is a monster, uh, of an animal. Uh, no one wants to have to go near. Guess what? You don't want to have to tangle with Satan either. All right? That's why we got the Lord, right? So, again... And some of the references in Job here can be equated with the devil as well with Leviathan. But here's the cool thing about Leviathan. As I said a while ago, he breathes fire. You mean, all right now, Kevin. You mean tell me you believe in fire breathing dragons? Why not? Let me ask you this. Anybody ever heard of the bombardier beetle? 
So let's, let's look at the bombardier beetle and see what he actually does here, if it will actually play here. All right, now. All right, so my video's not wanting to play. There it goes. All right, that's not very loud at all. All right, so basically what's happening here is that the bombardier beetle is able to sit there and shoot out a liquid chemical reaction that melts anything that it contacts. It, it ends up attacking ants and other small insects. With it, If it actually attacks a human, it can actually do severe damage to your skin. So it burns. So it's a very strong chemical reaction that it gives off and everything, and it burns like fire. It, so if God can do that with a one-inch beetle, what do you think he could do with something the size of Leviathan or some of these other giant lizards? Yeah, right? He can end up doing a lot with them. And the Bible even talks about fiery serpents quite a bit as well. The Bible does talk about fiery serpents. Again, they're actually mentioned five times in the Bible. We're going to look at four of the five references. I'm trying to save a little bit of time. <laughs> so again, fiery serpents, you have five mentions of the Bible. So first one we're going to look at is Numbers 21.6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. And talking about when the children of Israel went into the uh, daughters of Moab and had all those problems, God sent the fiery serpents through and took them out and started killing a bunch of people because they were sinning against the Lord. So they, not, they bit people, so they not only had these fire capabilities, apparently some type of chemical reaction they are able to do, but they also could bite people and it could hurt them pretty bad as well, so they were probably venomous on top of it. Deuteronomy 8.15, or sorry, 8.15, Deuteronomy 8.15. Who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein the, were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water? Who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint? So again, you have fiery serpents equated with scorpions and stuff. Again, don't want to tangle with them, right? It sounds like that'd be something you don't want to mess with. Isaiah 14.29. Rejoice not thou, O whole Palestinia, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. A fiery flying serpent. I didn't know serpents could fly. All those snakes can jump from one tree to another. But what do you think they're talking about? Pterosaurs. Probably, of some kind. Isaiah 36. The burden of the beasts of the south into the land of trouble and anguish. From whence come the young and old lion, the viper and, and fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches upon the shoulders of young asses and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to a people that shall not profit them. So here you have vipers, which we know about vipers, right? Then you have fi fiery flying serpents as well on top of it. So there's a difference between them. So the question is, all right, so if God made all these animals and stuff, whatnot, well, did the dinosaurs survive the flood? When God flooded the earth, did they end up surviving? Well, the answer is, yeah, the marine reptiles did. Because they're already in the water. <laughs> All the fish survived. Why? Because they're already in water. It didn't bother them one bit. Hey, we got some more wiggle room now. All right. Everybody always wants to say, well, how did Noah fit all the different species of the animals on the ark? He didn't. He fit different kinds of animals. And then he only had to fit land-breathing animals, birds and land animals. Fish didn't have to worry about, really didn't have to worry about bugs. If you've ever been in a flooded area, you know that bugs thrive in very wet conditions. Yeah, right? We live in a swampland, right? We know all about that. 
So again, the marine reptiles would have been okay during the flood. But what about the land reptiles? Well, what does the Bible say? Genesis six nineteen and 20. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. So does that include what we call dinosaurs? It'd have to. It's all, it says everything, right? In Genesis 7, 14, 15. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creepy thing after, that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. So dinosaurs were actually on the ark. God told Noah to bring two of every kind of animal onto the ark. And that would include what we call dinosaurs. Or what the Bible calls dragons. Alright Kevin, these things are massive. I mean, there's enough room on the ark for them. Well, let's look at the dimensions of the ark real quickly. So Noah's ark was pretty big. If you take the dimensions as given in the Bible... It is 437 feet long by 72.92 feet wide and 43.75 feet high. Has anybody ever been to the Ark Encounter over there in Kentucky? That is a full-scale replica of what the Ark would have been. It's huge, right? It's a lot bigger than what you imagine it to be. The volume that you're able to store in this thing is 1,396,000 cubic feet of volume. The gross tonnage is 13,960 tons. It has the capacity of 522 railroad stock cars. And it would be able to hold 125,280 sheep-sized animals. Is that a lot of animals? All right. Do you think they needed that many animals? No. They were definitely not that many animals. So, in fact, there are actually only about 50 different kinds of dinosaurs. If you actually look at the dinosaurs, there's different numbers depending on who you ask, but 50 is about the average. So, let's say there's about 50 different kinds of dinosaurs out there. So, again, so dinosaurs on the ark, again, you only got about 50 different kinds. And remember, Noah did not take species, he took kinds. So, you had the theropod kind. You had the sauropod kind. You had, I can't remember the triceratops kind is, but it's uh, similar to that. But they all came from, the. there's different versions of the triceratops. It's just one part of that kind. You had pterosaur kind. So you had one kind of each thing. Guess what? There's only two horses. There wasn't horses and zebras because why? A zebra is a horse. There wasn't donkeys or mules. Why? Because those are horse family. There's only two bears, two dogs, two cats. All two of all these different things. Well, how do we get all these different kinds? Because they multiplied and spread and adapted and changed and depending on where they were. I mean, all the cats and all the dogs came from just two of them. Yep. And you got these big, huge cats and these little bitty cats. Yep. It. You'd be surprised at like the dogs. Most of the different kinds of dogs breeds that we have today are only about 100 years old. They actually started breeding a lot of the dog breeds we know today right around 1900. So they're not that new. So again, all your dogs, all your cats, again, even all your dinosaurs came from the kinds, not the species. The kind would be more like a family in the taxonomic category. So it's a family. So basically your species and stuff can interbreed with each other, right? So a donkey and a horse can interbreed, right? And you get a mule. You know, a horse and a zebra can end up breeding. You get a zorse. And a donkey and a zebra can also breed, and you get a zonkey. And those are actually real animals. A lion and a tiger can breed. That's a liger. It's rare, but a sheep and a goat can breed. 
And they can actually produce offspring even though it's sterile, like the mule is sterile. And even a ram and a goat and a ram and a sheep can breed, again, but having sterile animals. If you're able to breed, you're a part of the same family and produce offspring. Whether they're sterile or not, you still have that ability and everything. So, again, they're part of that same family. Once you get to the family distinction, there's no more interconnectedness. That's where everything really separates out and there's no connective tissue. That's why the evolutionists want to change the order of everything to show how everything is linked instead of having these different categories because it doesn't fit their narrative the way they want it to fit it. So again, you have just a few different types of dinosaurs here. There are roughly 950 kinds of animals living and extinct. Roughly 950 different kinds of animals between what we have living and what are now extinct. This includes birds and, you know, again, land animals. What would be on the ark? So if Noah had to take two of every kind, 950 times two is 1,900. I'm not going to make you math tonight. So, so again, there are probably somewhere between 1,900 and 2,200 animals on the ark. We have a little bit higher because why? Noah did take seven of some kinds of what was considered clean. We do not know what those clean animals were. Leviticus gives us a list of clean animals, but we cannot guarantee that's the same list that Noah had because there's a long span of time between there. I mean, I'm talking about roughly 500 years or better between that, maybe even longer. So again, so you have about 1,900 to 2,200 different animals on the ark. And the ark could fit 125,280 animals. Sheep-sized animals. Think there's plenty of room? You got some elbow room, right? But come on now. But again, you take this giant thing right here that stands way above. We saw how big it was compared to us and a car, right? How are you going to squeeze that thing into the ark? Well, guess what? They probably took younger animals. <laughs> All the animals they took were probably juveniles. Uh, do I? Uh, I got some pictures when we went to the Ark Encounter on here. So again, they probably had younger animals and stuff. Why would you want younger animals? Well, they are smaller, so you can fit them in there. In fact, a lot of people don't realize that here's some fossilized dinosaur eggs. And the largest dinosaur egg that we have found is about this size right here, about the size of a football. That is the biggest dinosaur egg that's actually out there. These giant, huge creatures started off yay big. That's pretty small, right? So, again, they, they're smaller. They definitely weigh less, right? So you don't have the weight problem. They're also tougher in many ways. Juvenile animals and kids are usually tougher. Guess what? If a kid falls down, what happens usually? They bounce, they get back up and keep going, right? We fall down, we're down for probably a week, right? And everything. So what, younger, younger people, younger animals and stuff, what, they were more resilient. They bounce back quicker, they're a little bit tougher. They also eat less. You don't have to feed them as much. Well, I mean, you still feed them, but what? They do not actually eat the same tonnage as this thing would, right? If it's full scale, full size. And everything. Well, we're not talking about teenagers, talking about even younger than that. About, about animals that are maybe one or two years old were probably on the ark. Again, plenty of room for them. And here's some pictures from the ark encounter, how they kind of depict some of the dinosaurs that would have been on the ark in little cages and stuff. And Aaron, that's a sauropod dinosaur, similar to what we have here with our brachiosaurus. And here's a theropod dinosaur. We fit neatly into a small cage. That's probably about a good three by four foot cage that these two animals are in. Maybe slightly bigger, maybe six by five, somewhere around there. Here's some pterosaurs. They're a little bit harder to see, but I couldn't get a good picture of them. We have some pterosaurs there, flying reptiles. So yeah, so they were able to get on the ark pretty easily. 
And the reason why you want younger animals is what, as opposed to older animals also, when God, after they got off the ark, what did God tell them to do? Be fruitful and multiply. If you're younger, you can multiply a whole lot more than if you're older. All right. So you're able to have a lot more kids than you're younger than you are if you're older. All right. So what? It'll help to refill the animal population on the planet quicker. Right. And also during that time, what God put the fear of man in the animal. And that's when animals would start being afraid of people. And some of them even started attacking people. Because they're afraid, because God put that fear in them. Why would he do that? Well, before we farmed and stuff, but guess what? After the flood, there wasn't a lot of farmable land, so you had to eat something. Hey, God's like, no, you see that cow over there? Make a good hamburger. Even better steak. Yeah. So, again, I don't eat grass. Grass is the food for what I do eat. All right, so, at any rate. So again, the largest dinosaurs, again, were very small juveniles and stuff. So again, they could have fit on the ark and they would have lived after the ark. And tomorrow we'll look and see if there's any evidence for dinosaurs living beside man besides what the Bible says with the dragons and such. And I'm going to tell you, yes, yes, there are a lot of evidences for that. And then tomorrow on our second session, we'll finally find out what happened to the dinosaurs. And again... I can already tell you, give you a hint, they died. They died. So, hope everybody had a good time tonight as we went through this. But yes, dinosaurs are in the Bible.